And so on the podcast today is one of the greatest fighters in the world. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you believe in life after addiction? You better believe it. Now, the host of Life After Addiction. We're back, baby. Come on in the studio. Yes, very, very, very special guest today. We've been teasing out a little bit that we might have a special guest this week. Man, I'm excited. I am too. I'm excited. I'm a little bit fanning out a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I knew you would be, which is <laughs> well, what's crazy. Okay. It's like he was going to fangirl. He makes well, fun of me. Well, okay. Let's, let's not He say was fan. just talking about how I went to the Taylor Swift concert <laughs> this weekend and I was fangirling <laughs> out. I knew he would fangirl when we had uh, the guest today. Yes. So, hey, let me start with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, the new has come. Mm. Man, that's what God's Word said, and today's guest uh, has gone through it. And I'm going to let him tell you about it, but he's gone through uh, a lot of different aspects of life, and he finds himself at the top of uh, his career and the, and the greatest place he could be. Uh, today's guest, I'm happy to say, is Jared Flash Gordon. Welcome, man. Thanks so much. Come on. Thanks, guys, for having me. Um, happy to be here, and uh, yeah, I'm here to, you know, tell how it was for me and what it's like now and the things that I've, you know, I've done to uh, get here. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, Jared Gordon, he is an, a UFC fighter. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about that for just a second, because if you don't know, I think you need to know. So a UFC fighter is a, a MMA fighter, mixed martial arts and UFC is I don't think it's debated. I think it's a fact that they are the number one promotion in fighting. They have the absolute best fighters in the world. And so on the podcast today is one of the greatest fighters in the world, the greatest mixed martial artist, the greatest combat sport guy, one of in the world. And man, I've just, I started following his journey because he was open about his struggles, his recovery struggles. And he's open about it. And he's not just open about it, but he's like pleading with people, hey, reach out to me. And so, man, I reached out to him one day. I was like, you know, I don't care. I probably yeah. won't respond. And sure enough, he did. Wow. Uh, and I just started. And I want to share with you guys just the last two, um, th his last two fights, just because I want you to see the character of this man uh, and the way that he's using the platform that, that God's given him. And so he's coming up, man. He's, he's got a good record. He's getting better and better. And he fights this guy two fights ago named Patty Pimblett. Patty Pimblett, if you're, if you're not familiar, he's a rising star. He's from the U.K., uh, and man, I watched the fight. Jared beat him very handedly. Uh, goes the decision, and the judges <laughs> say that Patty won. And I want to go to a clip real quick. We don't have it here, but we will in post. Everyone on the planet knows that Jared won, except for maybe Patty, and I think even Patty knows. Yeah. Here's a here's a clip of of Joe Rogan's face when they announced that Patty won. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's a double take. It was awesome. And so Jared takes that man. He's furious. He's frustrated. Uh, but all of a sudden, he sees that God's given him a platform. So what does he do? He starts talking about his struggles. He starts talking about his uh, his past and how God has has led him through a recovery situation. Oh man! And so I'm I'm fired up now, and I'm reaching out, and I'm following, and I'm praying for him. Uh, and then next, man, he gets this absolute killer of a fight, a guy named Bobby Green. To, for context, the current champion in his weight class fought Bobby Green and then had a title shot. That's how tough this dude is. Goes through the things, having to deal with the loss, which wasn't a loss, but I have to deal with all that. And then he goes into this fight, and, man, he's looking awesome. And Bobby Green's a killer. Uh, he's looking great, awesome in the first round. I don't think Bobby uh, was expecting it. And then all of a sudden, Bobby Green headbutts him and knocks him to the ground, which is ruled a no contest. Mm. I'm frustrated. I, I, I think uh, I watched it. You can watch it for yourself. Uh, I think Bobby Green, based on his last – I don't know. I don't want to say it. Uh, Jared would never say this, but I think it was somewhat intentional because Jared was doing work. So if Jared wins that fight – and so now uh, if he wins that fight, who knows what's next. So now it's ruled a no contest. No, no contest and um, – yeah, man, Jared's just two in a row. He's like, man, I should have won. He didn't get half his check for both of these uh, mm. that he should have gotten. That's tough. And, man, he processes it. But even right after the fight, 
he posts something. He go because Bobby wants to call himself King now. And right, <laughs> right after the fight, Jared posts this thing, and he goes, "There's only one true King, and it's a, the cross." And he's talking about Jesus. It was mm. awesome. So, Jared, man, you're inspiring so many people. Um, us ourselves have gone through addiction, uh, and to see you at the highest level in the world, uh, and know that you've gone through it, man. Would you share your testimony with us? Tell us a little bit about, um, I mean, I could tell it just based on what you've told, but let's hear it from you. You know, how, what was life like? Uh, tell us about the things that you've gone through and now just at the pinnacle and the greatest fighting promotion in the world. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so growing up, I came from a, I had a, I had a great childhood. My father was a blue collar guy, but he did well for himself. Um, he, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, we had a lot of problems, tragedies in the, in the family and, um, things that happened with my father's business that, you know, did like, I guess, set us back, but I never really, I never needed anything that I didn't have. Um, most of the things that I wanted, I had, I didn't, you know, we didn't struggle, you know, there was always food on the table. We lived in nice homes and, you know, my father, my father did well for himself. He was a business guy, uh, since, you know, he worked hard from a young age and took over my grandfather's business and he turned it in him and my uncle turned it into a, you know, million dollar company. And, uh, they're, you know, like I said, they're blue collar guys with a wholesale hardware company, um, in, in New York city, they did really well. They, or wholesale and retail, and you know they delivered uh, products to all the boroughs in the city, and you know they did really well for themselves. And uh, you know the, the recession came, and right before the recession, the business actually burned down and mm. um, killed three FDNY guys and injured like sixty other do uh, sixty other FDNY and NYPD officers. Um, and it was the deadliest fire in New York city since 1969. And mm. they lost tons of money because of it. And, you know, it took years and years for them to rebuild the business and get back into the swing of things. And that was in 2001 on father's day. It was called the father's day fire. Mm. Uh, all of the, the men that died had children. And, um, so it was a very devastating fire. Tragic. It was tragedy. Uh, Mayor Giuliani was there watching it burn down. It was uh, it was a really big thing, and then nine eleven happened, and it kind of like yeah, swiped it under the yeah yeah it was swiped it under the the rug in a sense. Um, and then it took them you know six seven years for them to rebuild the business and get back into a building, and, uh, and then the recession came. So there was a lot of like trying times for my family. You know, um, it was really tough and we moved from where we were living in into Queens, New York, because we, we couldn't afford to live where we were living in Long Island anymore. Um, and it was just easier to be closer to the business. So, you know, I watched my father go through a lot and he recently, I just, I was just at lunch with him last week and, you know, I was telling him how uh, frustrated and upset I was over these last two fights and, you know, talking about my financial, you know, as you mentioned, I, I didn't get two of two of my checks, because of it, you know, you get your show money and you get your win money. Yeah. So I, you know, I showed up to both fights, so I got my show money, but I get double the money if I win. And I was on the way to winning, you know, I won the first one and I was on the way to winning the second one. And yeah, I think so, so you know, and he was like, dude, look what I, what I went through, man. Mm. And look where I am now. And now he's, you know, retired and uh, he's cashed out of everything. So he's, you know, he's doing well. And, uh, and I was like, you know what, you're right. Like, and I, you know, for, for a minute there, even my mother, I remember said to me one time when I was younger, like, don't be surprised if your father kills himself mm. because he was drinking away, you know, drugging away. And, uh, my father had a history with cocaine abuse and alcohol abuse. And, uh, you know, I was scared for a while that maybe my father would kill himself. Yeah. Um, you know, he lost millions of dollars and it was crazy. Um, but going back to me, um, when I was eight years old, I, I always share this in my testimony because I, I know now that it shaped me 
to become who I became. And I self-medicated probably unconsciously because of this. Um, but I went to a sleepaway camp when I was eight years old. And when I was there, I was sexually assaulted by a camp counselor, mm. um, another male, um, full on assault. Mm. You know, I remember, I remember vividly the, the sounds and the, the pain and the smells. And it was very, you know, it's a vivid memory for me. And, uh, you know, I didn't talk about that till I was 23 years old. Um, yeah, of course you self meditated so there. Gosh. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I buried it, uh, deep down and, you know, it came out in other ways later on. Um, but I came home from, from camp that, that, uh, you know, the end of the summer school started, it was fall time. I turned September, I, I turned nine that September. Um, and shortly after that, I began smoking pot. Um, I have an older brother, Dylan, who's also in recovery. He's about two years older than me. And we had some family friends that were like 13, 14 years old. And we used to hang out with them after school like, every day. And those kids were smoking pot. You know, they were at that age where they were experimenting. But because I was with them, you know, I also began experimenting. And, you know, I was nine years old. Golly. That's really it's young. Like, yeah, that's Looking, young. you know, at the time I thought whatever, like, like fourth thought, grade, fifth grade. Yeah, it was fourth grade. Wow, I, I thought it was normal. You know, this is what people do. And but looking back at it, a nine-year-old smoking pot. If I saw a nine-year-old smoking pot, I'd slap him. Yeah. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah, my son's eight. And, my son's eight right now, and I couldn't imagine yeah. him. I don't. He doesn't even know what pot is. Exactly. That's crazy, man. So, you know, I started drinking, you know, hanging out outside and doing what I guess kids that were a little bit older would be doing at that age. Uh, so I, I, you know, I got a jump on it early. Um, by the time I was 11, I was smoking pot every day. Mm. You know, I had people that I could call to, to buy, you know, weed. And, um, I, we lived in a small area in Long Island in Nassau County. And like the town was small and everyone knew each other. So all the younger kids knew all the older kids. And uh, it was a wealthy area. So all, everyone had money. All the kids had money. So, and, you know, they, everyone had a car. So it was very easy for us to, you know, get drugs and alcohol. And um, the parents were very open and they weren't strict at all. Um you know, parents would go on vacations and leave their kids at home and, you know, go out for dinner Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, leave the kids at home. And what were we doing? We we're going through their liquor cabinets and through the medicine cabinets and uh, going through their closets and finding, you know, pot or pain pills or, you know, uh, prescription pills and, you know, stealing their liquor. And that's what we did, you know. And then as I got older, 13, 14, 15, um, you know, we were, that's what we did every day. We, after school, we would hang out, get high and drink or, and so my addiction started at a very young age. Um, and through the course of high school, you know, I experimented with just about every drug besides like opiates yet. Um, and, you know, I did every drug in the book by the time I was 18 besides, you know, getting heavy into opiates, um, Xanax and benzos and all the, you know, I, I don't want to like tell my drug a log, sure. but I just want to give you like a background on how it was for me. You know, yeah. if, if it was um, there, you were taking it pretty much. Yeah. If it was there, I took it. Yeah, I, sure. when I was 13, I had my first experience with cocaine, my first real experience with cocaine. Um, so like I said earlier, my father had, a a thing with cocaine as well. And he would stay out some nights and not come home. And I used to wonder and ask my mom, like, yo, where's, where's dad? And she, he, she always used to say, oh, he's, he's driving around. And I would be like, he's driving around. What do you mean he's driving around? It's 3 a.m. Uh, so he would come home at 5, 6 a.m. and pass out or whatever. And I would, uh, I was curious. So I would go into his car and I would look around and 
He said he was driving around, so I wanted to know what he was doing in his car. Um, and when I was, you know, go when I would go through his car, I would find like little specks of white stuff everywhere, and you know, I would take it and smell it, and you know, I tasted it, and I, I, I think at the time I knew what it was, I guess, but I didn't really know what it was, and I remember my lips getting numb uh. and. Feeling that feeling in your stomach. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. The feeling that cocaine yeah. gives you. Hell yeah. Uh, and I remember, like, I was, like, only six or seven. You know, eight years old, maybe. Golly. And um, so, like, I had already been introduced to drugs at a really, really young age. But, you know, it was 13 years old. I remember when I had my first, when I actually had really tried cocaine for the first time. And uh, I remember I was in the back of a friend's car who was like three or four years older than me. I was 13 and he was 17 or whatever, 16. You know, he just got his permit or something like that. And we're driving around smoking pot. And I remember uh, coincident coincidentally, it was a Cream CD, uh, the, the band Cream. Hmm. And... You know, I'm sniffing cocaine off of it, and and we're driving around listening to the the song "White Room," hmm. right? That's what's called "White Room" in a white room with black curtains, which I think was like you know a song about drugs. Um, and you know, like I was off to the races, basically. You know, I thought this is what people do when they get older; they do drugs, and it was normal. It was normal. Yeah. They don't, you know, everyone that was around me was, was doing well. You know, they had money, they lived in big, nice houses and they had nice cars. And, uh, but I knew on the weekends that the parents would go out and eat dinner and drink and come home, smell, you know, smelling like pot and, uh, probably doing other drugs, you know, there's, and so I just thought that that was life. Um, so like I said, my father's business had burnt down. And when I was third, when I was 14, we moved to Queens. Um, and you know, my high school career went on the way it went on. I, I graduated high school by the skin of my teeth. Did you wrestle in high school at all? Did you do any wrestling? I wrestled in junior high oh, okay. in fifth grade one year. And then when I moved to Queens, there was no wrestling program in the oh, city yet. Okay. Now there's wrestling all over the city. But when I was younger, there, there wasn't wrestling wasn't a big thing. It was all city sports, basketball, yeah. handball, uh, and that was it because there was no grass, you know, oh. <laughs> there was no football fields. There wasn't baseball fields. Like hmm. at least where I lived, it was very, very urban where I lived in, yeah, yeah. in, in Queens. So there wasn't big grass fields, but, um, and by the way, just to interject, I mean, you, you know, we all have a past when you hear those sirens going off in the background, we're all for a split second, like <laughs> checking out the window for just a second, <laughs> but we're yeah, good. Yeah. We're past that now. That's not us anymore. I was just thinking <laughs> someone committed a crime or something. Um, <laughs> So I graduated high school and I was heading down the wrong path, man. Yeah. I was, I started to like get involved in criminal activities and, you know, I was getting, you know, using drugs and alcohol and partying. And at that time it was still kind of fun though. I was, you know, going to parties, going to bars, hanging out with my friends and we were having fun. Um, and then I found MMA when I graduated high school um i actually got accepted to a school for 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 pharmacy i was going to go do a pharmacy program oh, wow. which is funny because you know imagine me as a pharmacist yeah, one for you um, two for me one for you three for me yeah, yeah i would have stole all the drugs <laughs> yeah so i uh i found mma at the time the ufc started to blow up it was 2006 2007 the ultimate fighter was huge at that time it was you know uh Forrest Griffin versus Stefan Bonner they just had fought that fight and that's what like blew the UFC up yep uh I remember Frank Yeager had just made his UFC debut and he was like one of my favorite fighters um and I remember I was watching it nonstop. I couldn't stop watching it it was on Spike TV anytime it was on Spike I watched it any event I would watch um so one day I came out of the subway in Queens and I look up and there's an MMA gym. I had no idea it was there. It was there for a while. Mm. Uh, so I walked in there 
And I signed up. And that following Monday, I think it was like Sunday or Saturday when I walked in there, that following Monday, I did my first uh, jujitsu class. And I fell in love with it right away. Um, and four months later, I had my first amateur fight. I won. And that's what really, I was like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to fight. Um, and at the time I was, you know, still in school, enrolled in school. I wasn't going, I, I went to one class. I never went back, but my father was like, my parents thought I was going to school. Um, so my dad was like, look, you got to choose one. You can't fight and go to pharmacy. It's just not possible. So I was like, all right, I'm going to fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he wanted me to uh, pick school. But um, a couple of months later, I hurt my neck training. And go. I remember I was hanging out in a bar with my friend. Compla- I was complaining about my neck. And he was like, he was selling Vicodin. And he was like, you want a Vicodin? I was like, all right. So I took one and I remember I had a drink and I think we left and smoked a joint. And I remember this warm feeling came over me from, from the pain pills. And I was like, this is it. This is the drug that I was looking for, you know? Hmm. Um, so I got addicted to pain pills. You know, within weeks, I'm eating 10, 20, 30 pills a day. Uh, and... Shortly after that, I found Oxycontin yep. and I got, you know, I started taking that, you know, I was eating them. Then I started sniffing them and then I started smoking them. And then I went, you know, I was fully addicted to pain pills and uh, I went to my first treatment center and I met a couple of kids in there. We left early and mm-hmm. we AMA'd, yep. you know, from Ag- treatment. Against medical uh, advice, they, yeah. Yeah, and they introduced me to to needles, how to how to use a needle. Mm. Um, so now I'm shooting the pills, and then I found heroin, and then I just from there it was just IV drug use, um, heroin, cocaine, crack. I would anything I could put in a needle, I would shoot it. Mm. Um, towards the end, really, I just wanted to shoot cocaine, but I was physically dependent on opiates, so I. I always had to, you know, do heroin also. Yeah. Um, and throughout that time, from 22 to 27, I was in that treatment. Yeah. You know, I did every kind of treatment center you can imagine. I I went to one really nice place, the first one, which was somewhat nice. It wasn't that nice, but it was like, you know, I needed insurance to get in there. Um, and then after that, the insurance cut me off. So... All the places I went to after that were basically state-run facilities. Ooh. So I did long-term treatment. I went to a therapeutic community. I was there for six months, which is like intense treatment, uh, homeless shelters, crisis centers, um, psych wards. I've been in multiple psych wards. Is that because of overdoses? Did you have any overdoses? Uh, overdoses. I tried killing myself. Oh, yeah. Um. You know, I think one of them, I just wanted to get off the street. So I was like, oh, I'm going to kill myself. And they put me in there. Um, I think I was in like 12 or 13 treatment centers, multiple psych wards, hospital stays, homeless shelters. I was panhandling. Um, I got arrested eight times Mm. because of my indirectly or directly because of my my substance abuse. I got arrested for a home invasion robbery, felony battery in Florida, and it was carrying a uh, 25 to life sentence. Mm. Um, I beat that only because the person that was supposed to testify against me never showed up to court Mm. and they let me go. Uh, But he was a wanted felon. So he wasn't going to come to court, testify against me and then get arrested. Yeah. So, I got really lucky with that. I would still be in prison. I got arrested in 2012 for that. So I would be like 11 years into a sentence right now. Mm. Um, You know, who knows? Maybe they would have reduced the sentence or gave me something lighter. Or maybe I would have had some good, (laughs) some, some good uh, prison time. And maybe they would have reduced my sentence. I could have been out by now, but 
you know, I, it was carrying a heavy sentence. Uh, but that wasn't enough, you know. I, I came out of jail. I was in a maximum security holding, uh, uh, maximum security holding center, and here in Palm Beach County, and I uh, had my first overdose that night. Mm. I was 22. The night you, you got know, out. I, yeah, the night that I got out. Oh, wow. You know, I was clean for a little bit because I was in jail. So when I came out, I went bought some heroin and I overdosed. Mm. Um, and, you know, I just kept running and going and going and going. Um, I had some, some sobriety, some, oh, some abstinence. I wouldn't say sobriety. Um, I got, I went away for six months. I stayed, so, I stayed abstinent for 14 months after that. Uh, and then I had a shoulder surgery. I relapsed. Mm. Then I got, I was abstinent again for about a year and a half. I had a big fight. Um, but I got injured badly in the fight and I had to have a metal plate put in my face. And I was in the trauma unit for like five days, the head, the head trauma unit. And they were pumping me with Dilaudid and morphine. Yeah. So when I came out, naturally I, I relapsed. Um, and then I ran after that relapse for about six months. It got really, really bad for me. Uh, I was homeless. You know, I was stealing and robbing to to get money you know for drugs and food and yeah. to live in motels and you know flop houses and stuff like that and uh i had my last overdose christmas day 2015 mm. i woke up in the hospital on the 26th super super dope sick so i left i got high one more time and then I went to detox that night, and I've been sober since. Yeah. Um, when I was in there, you know, I kept, you know, I went to a lot of meetings up until that point. Yeah. You know, I, I never stayed sober, but the seed of AA was planted in my head, and you know, I had a lot, I had people, I had this one guy trying to help me, who eventually became my sponsor, um, and he kept saying to me like. You got to find God, you know, start talking to your higher power. And, uh, I th you know, at first when I heard that I used my friends that had died from our disease, uh, as my higher power. And I would say to myself, like, all right, I'm going to do this for them because I know that they don't want me to go out the way they went out. Hmm. And then after a while, I started to realize like, all right. There's something bigger out there than my dead friends, you know? Yeah. Um, so now, you know, I call him Jesus. Um, yeah, the, and I the remember higher power, yeah. <laughs> the highest power, yeah. yeah. So I went, I, I remember being in, in the, the rehab. It was a terrible place. It was called Creedmoor. It was a uh, state-run facility. Shout out to Creedmoor. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the people there were mandated, you know, by yeah. drug courts or, and, uh, I remember one night it snowed like five feet and I'm sitting there uh, staring out the window thinking to myself like, oh man, I'm stuck here. <laughs> yeah. But then I remember thinking like, well, it's not that bad, you know? Um, I was warm. I remember I had like a hoodie on and a pair of sweatpants. So I was like comfortable. You know, I had, I was there for about three weeks at that point. So I wasn't really that sick anymore. Uh, I had a, you know, a belly full of food, and I remember just closing my eyes and being like, "All right, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to pray or how this works, but you know, if you're there, I need you." Uh, and then that's how it started for me, you know. Um, yeah, I came out and I dove into AA. Went to meetings nonstop. Did my my twelve steps, uh, and I just looked to God. You know, I prayed. And, you know, I worked hard, and uh, a year later, I got signed to UFC. 
Hey guys, so as you can see, man, the hangs are heating up with uh, Jared Flash Gordon. Man, we decide because he gets really deep, uh, like he hasn't already gotten deep, but he gets, uh, we get to a really cool point and we wanted to make this two different episodes. So we're going to end this one right here uh, and make sure that you tune in next week for part two with our interview with our podcast with Jared Flash Gordon.